Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another Columbus Zoo Virtual Learning Academy. You might notice there is a materials uh, slide up here right now. So we're gonna give you just a few moments to go around your house and gather a few simple items that we'll need for today's program. Let me explain a little bit what we're doing here. So if you, once you get the items, you know exactly what to do. If you could find a piece of paper, um, and it can be any scrap piece of paper, it doesn't have to be white, it can be any color you want. You're gonna wanna grab a writing utensil again, I put a picture of markers, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be, um, hi Logan, it can be pencils, it can be crayons, um, whatever you want. And then we do need some scissors, or if you feel comfortable tearing, you can do that too. And here's, hi Natalie, here's my um, word of advice with the scissors. Uh, if, if you are not comfortable doing that, or that is a skill that you haven't quite mastered yet, that's okay. You can ask your big person nearby for some help. Hi, Stephanie, Abby. Uh, I will say we have just over 300 participants this morning in our webinar, so those names come through really fast. Hi, Ella. Good morning, Chloe and Marla, um, through on my screen. So I'll do my best to shout everybody out. But um, just be aware that you can still actively use the chat, even if I don't say your name specifically. The last thing you will need is something to hold your strips of paper together. It can be glue, it can be a glue stick, it can be um, a paper clip, a staple, whatever is nearby and convenient for your family. Um, so we want to make this as easy as possible on you. Hi, Aubrey and Liam. <laughs> and now with your piece of paper, you can kind of see there's a picture on this screen. We don't need as many strips of paper um, that the person there is going to cut. We need a total of four and you can, they, again, they can be any size with whatever you want to do here. Um, I'm going to hold these up. Brandon is working behind the scenes here. But again, like right now, it's not going to say anything on these strips of paper, but you need one, two, three, four total. Okay. You can hide Crosley. You can cut them. Again, the width doesn't matter. Um, really, truly, the length doesn't need to be that particular either. I used an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. But again, whatever works for your family. Hi, Peter. And Emily, <laughs> so lovely to have all of you guys joining us this morning. Hi, Delaney. <laughs> all right, so again, we'll just wrap up finding all of those materials. It is a piece of paper, some scissors to cut that paper, something to glue, some sort of adhesive. Hi, Carrington, and then something to draw or write with as well, okay? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get my slide queued up here behind the scenes, but you guys can. Hi, Mrs. Hutchins class. Oh my gosh, I love that your whole class is on here. Okay, I'm gonna move to the next slide. If you're still finding those materials, that's okay. I just wanna make sure I'm ready for everybody here. Hi, Ryan. Okay, so this next slide tells us, gives us a little hint about some of the animals that we're going to be talking about. Hi, Gabrielle and Dylan today, but I did want to introduce the chat feature here on our Zoom call. So the chat feature, which many of you guys are using right now, and that is fantastic. Hi, Hudson. Hi, Stan. Um, the chat feature is a way for me to see what your answers are, um, but it's also a way for you to interact with the other participants in the program. Um, and so you're going to want to make sure that you have the all participants view open if you would like to type answers and interact with everybody else in the webinar. Um, I will say also these programs are designed to hit a variety of ages here. So um, our folks that are maybe pre-K kindergarten versus the friends that are maybe second, third grade, there's a little something here for everybody. But if you are not the best typer or you just want to see some of the animals at the zoo, please, please still stay connected. You do not have to do all of the activities that we're doing. Hi, Craig. Hi, Scarlett. <laughs> All right, so if you haven't already, maybe drop a little chat, even if it's just your name. Hi, Aiden, Avery, and Reese, um, and get familiar with that chat box feature. Again, it's a way for us to interact um, together and for me to see some of your answers. Hello, Logan, and Lucas, and Gavin, and Anne Marie, and Katie. 
like I said, so many friends logging on here this morning. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Sounds like you guys are discovering uh, the chat box and it's working out well. Let me tell you a little bit about myself here. If you joined us last week, you already know, but for some of our new faces, I'm delighted to meet you this morning. My name is Carrie and I work in the conservation, education and engagement department at the zoo. And I'll be kind of the face that you're seeing and I'll be the one doing a little bit of talking and helping us kind of discover some of the science concepts here today. But there is one other super duper important part of um, this webinar and his name is Brandon. He is kind of behind the scenes here, but he is doing a lot of technology help <laughs> for me. He's also monitoring the chat box. And that's really important because as we move on throughout the program, if you have a question and I don't see it um, quickly enough on the screen, Brandon and I will try to catch those in the chat box and he may chat with you directly through the chat box or um, side on, on the side through the question and answer box. Um, so keep that in mind. And if we get a ton of questions that we can't cover during the time of the actual program, we will certainly be willing to stay on five or 10 minutes afterwards, just so hi Kai, um, so we can answer all your questions and, and really um, make sure you're taken care of here. So again, my name is Carrie. Brandon is behind the scenes here and you are connected with the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. Hi Lucas and Graham, okay. So the word for today is food chain, right? And that's a super duper important word here at the zoo. So we're going to explain what that means and kind of see it in action for you and for animals. And we're gonna be using examples from the heart of Africa region here at the zoo and the watering hole. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to explore that region at the zoo. And then we're gonna bring all of those food chain ideas together and talk about food webs. Hi, Wesley. Um, so that's kind of our plan for today and moving forward. Okay, so to talk about food chains, of course, you have to talk about what, what have you been eating, right? So I want you to think for just a moment about maybe what you had for breakfast. I'm going to use the example of what I had for dinner last night. We used our grill last night for dinner and we grilled up some chicken. So here you can kind of see on the slide in front of you, there's two ways to look at this. Um, you can see a picture format on one side of the screen and a word format on the other. They mean the exact same thing. It's just different ways of kind of um, viewing it. <laughs> Omar had a burrito with steak. Hey, that sounds great, Omar. I like, I like burritos too. <laughs> and a smoothie, perfect. So for me, you can see my picture there at the top. I ate chicken. So I put that chicken in my belly and that's what's giving me all of the energy to teach this webinar today, to maybe run around and play outside later with my family, to do creative things. Um, whatever you ate, that's always kind of below you on the food chain, right? Because it, you, you ate it, you got energy from it, but it doesn't stop there. So we have me at the top so far, we have the chicken below me. <laughs> Waffles sound great <laughs> and Pop-Tarts. Um, but now we need to think about what did the chicken eat? So this is a great time to use the chat box. If you have some ideas about what a chicken ate and what's gonna go kind of where that question mark is below the chicken, drop them into the chat box. Somebody, oh, corn, seeds. You guys are on it already. They ate some seeds, they ate some grass, chicken feed. <laughs> worms, bugs, you guys are on the right track. Everybody has the right answer this morning. <laughs> Dirt, grain, seed, absolutely. So the chickens you see in a farmyard um, or a barn area are gonna eat um, a lot of grains, okay? And so that's the next picture we've put now below the chicken, okay? So just to review, you have me at the top, I ate the chicken, the chicken is below me, and now the food that the chicken ate is below the chicken. Sometimes chicken eat, chickens eat bugs, certainly, and worms also. Those don't sound very good to us, but nonetheless, they're still part of our food chain. Um, so we have now an updated form of our food chain, okay? We have our three pictures, and we have one last question um, to answer. So again, use the chat box and think about the corn and the seeds that ch the chicken eats um, are also getting energy from something. So what gives corn and plants the energy to grow? If you know the answer, drop it in the chat box and then we'll update our food chain once more. Julie says the sun, perfect. 
Ethan, Marisol, Susan, Kai, Mara, you guys are on it. <laughs> Water and sun, exactly. This is such a smart group already, I can tell. So let's update our food chain. You guys, Braxton, Caden, you've got it. The Gardner's family, they know it, Charlotte. <laughs> Grosley, exactly. So now our food chain is updated. So let's start at the bottom this time because there's something else I wanna draw a little bit of attention to. So we have the sun giving a lot of energy to plants, okay? And energy in a food chain is represented by an arrow. You see the arrow always moving up in a food chain. So those blue arrows, keep your eyes on those. The sun gives energy to the plants. In this case, it's the, the corn and seeds that the chicken ate. And then the chicken, once it eats it, um, it goes right up to the chicken. The arrow is still moving up. And then once I eat the chicken, I'm getting a little bit of energy too. So the arrow moves up one more time from the chicken to me. So on a food chain, you, <laughs> you ate KFC. <laughs> Um, you guys are making me laugh. So as we move up the food chain, the arrows show us which direction the energy is moving and it's always up and out from the sun. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we know about us in a food chain, let me tell you one more thing. Obviously I had a little bit more for dinner last night than just the chicken. So this is just one food chain that I'm part of, okay? Um, all of the foods that you eat with every meal are part of different food chains, okay? Because on any given day, you're not eating the same thing. All right, so let's move on here because we know about us now and we know about what we eat, but what does that really look like at the zoo, okay? Well, it's pretty simple. It, it kind of means the same thing, right? Um, the animals at the zoo here also have to eat. And so when we show the, a food chain at the zoo, we're gonna do the same thing. We wanna show how the energy is moving between the animals based on what they eat, okay? So we have a lot of different food examples right here. We got some lettuce. Of course, some animals eat meat just like we do. We have a lot of produce and grains there. So I thought that it would be really fun um, to see kind of a behind the scenes look at our animal nutrition department. They are the people that make and prepare and measure and count all of the food that goes not just to our Africa region animals, but everywhere at the zoo. So let's connect back with them. They are always, always busy in the morning at the zoo. They come in very, very early. So let's see what they're up to. Um, and again, we're focusing on the heart of Africa region here at the zoo. Those are the animals we're interested in, but let's see what our animal nutrition department is up to. So this is Lisa. You can see they kind of, they kind of work in a big kitchen area, right? And so everything that they need, the scales, knives, paper towels, bags, bins, all of that stuff is right there for them. Right now, this is an important food source for one of our animals later on. She's weighing and measuring and um, kind of taking in the size there of the cow bones that some of our meat eaters are gonna eat later on. Now we're, we're measuring and weighing out fish. Some of our animals eat fish. Our penguins eat fish. Sometimes our, our rays eat a little bit of fish. We also have a feed room and that's where all the bags of food um, that are a little bit like cereal that we eat, that's where those are stored. Um, all of the produce goes through animal nutrition and then they put it in those bins and they ship it out to the different regions of animals at the zoo. So again, we're kind of giving you an overview here of um, all of the different types of foods that animals eat. It could be the mealworms you just saw, it could be crickets, maybe they're an insect eater, it could be fish, it could be meat, it could be plants, okay? Why mealworms, Abby says? Well, actually, Abby, a lot of um, animals eat mealworms. Um, all of the birds in our aviary get fed out some of the mealworms. Um, in my classroom, we have some, some lizards that eat a lot of mealworms, or even what we call super, super worms. And Crosley says the turtles eat the worms. You're exactly right. And somebody said it was protein. You're exactly right. It's like protein for a lot of our animals. So, all right. So speaking of our animals here, we wanna kind of introduce you to some important words and we're gonna relate that to a food chain now and our animals here at the zoo. So the first important vocabulary word um, is what is the producer, right? And the little hint off there to the right-hand side when you see the arrows moving up, you see it all starts with the sun and the energy now has to move up. So who does the sun? Think back to what we talked to. Logan is right, the producer is the plant. 
Exactly. Um, so if, if you guys were thinking that too, I see Claire and Quinn have dropped that in the chat box. Mila doesn't like fish. I, they're not my favorite either, Mila. <laughs> but they are a lot of zoo animals' favorites here. <laughs> a plant, Lexi says, you guys are on the right track. So the producer is always the plant. Here we go. It's an organism that can produce its own food, right? Someone asked earlier if we were going to see some animals. We definitely are going to get to the animals, but to set us up for that, we have to talk about what comes first in the food chain, and it's always animals. Um, or sorry, it's always plants. So in our backyard, that might look like a tree. In a desert, that might look like a cactus. Um, in Africa, that looks like a lot of acacia trees and things like that. So here's what we need to do. Real quickly, grab your first um, sheet of paper. Hopefully you have the time to cut them into strips. Brandon's going to help me zoom in on this piece of paper. Thanks, Brandon. Um, and again, whatever size yours is, that is totally fine. Okay. You are going to write sun on the first piece of paper. Here's mine. Um, I, if, if you are not great at making letters just yet, that's okay. Maybe you can just make a little yellow sun or you can just color it yellow. Um, but this is the start of our food chain right here. And once you've written or drawn something that helps you remember that it's a sun, we're gonna take those two edges and make it into a circle, okay? And this is where you need the glue or some sort of adhesive to hold this together, okay? I'm gonna use my stapler just because it's a little bit quicker. When you're done, you should have a completed loop here, okay? Again, we have to make the sun first because it's what starts everything. Without the sun, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get very far. Once you've done your sun loop, then you wanna do your producer loop. You guys knew it was plants. So on mine, I drew a little bit of grass. If you wanna draw a leaf, that's fine. If you wanna write the word producer, that's great too. So I'll give you a moment to fill both of those loops out and then I'll show you what we're gonna do with our producer here. So Brandon's gonna keep the screen on me for just a moment while you guys are finishing that up at home. <laughs> Crossley says, I'll be right back. If you guys need to run out and get, get materials from a different room, that is okay. <laughs> We're gonna keep it casual this morning. <laughs> when you do have your second loop done, you're gonna take it and put it through your first loop, right? So now we're gonna take that second loop, match those two ends up and make sure they stay together because now they're connected, right? Just like everything in a food chain is connected, these are connected, okay? So take just a few moments to finish that up. I'm gonna show you one more time and then Brandon's gonna move the screen back to um, see an animal here in a minute, okay? so. Your loop should be connected. Hopefully this is just like, if you used a, a, a stapler, that's great. Whatever you're using, make sure it's something you feel comfortable with. How do you spell that? Emily, we're gonna put that right back on the screen. Sun is S-U-N and producer should be right there on the screen for you. Again, if, you, if producer is too much, you can always just color it green or draw a little leaf or a flower because producers are all of the plants, okay? They don't have to look a certain way. And this is just to help remind us that everything is connected. All right, while you guys work on that, I'm gonna get us set up to look at our first producers in the heart of Africa region. Hi, Crosley, welcome back. Michelle, we will wait for you, um, but we're also going to look uh, at the next uh, slide here because I wanna show you some producers in action here at the zoo, okay? Um, so, this is our heart of Africa region. Don't pay too much attention to the animal, although I know it's hard not to. Look at what they're eating, right? Do you see how there's lots of grass on the ground? I hope you do. The grass is the producer, okay? The grass, especially right now in the springtime, is using all of the sun's energy and that rain um, to grow nice and green because it's going to be food for a lot of the animals um, on the savanna here, okay? We have gazelles, we have impala, we have um, wildebeest back there, zebras, but what we're really focusing on right now is the producers. Right now the grass is, is green in the heart of Africa region because we're still getting a lot of rain, it's the springtime, the weather's not as hot as it will be this summer. Um, but if you come to the zoo later on in the summer, you'll notice it gets a little bit more yellow or brown. Um, and, and that's okay too, the animals will still eat it. 
Um, also, don't be worried. <laughs> this is not the only food they get. They certainly get a lot more fresh browse from our animal care staff and the animal nutrition department. But I wanted you to be able to see firsthand that we, we plant some of those producers too so that it can grow right in the region for them. Okay. All right, we're gonna connect back to my PowerPoint here because it's time to move on. So look what we have so far. We have the sun. You guys made that strip. We have um, the sun giving energy to the producers. That's why you made that producer strip. Now, the question becomes in the food chain, what is an animal that eats plants going to be called? And hint, it's right there on your screen, right? If you look up from producer to what the arrow goes to, drop in the chat box. <laughs> April says it's a consumer, yep. You got it, Bronson says it's consumer. Sarah, Omar, Crosley, Madison. We're right on track, you guys. I knew you could get it. <laughs> Kara, Caroline, Hadley, perfect. Now, since it's the first consumer, we use kind of a fancy way to say that. We say primary consumer, okay? So in a food chain, an animal that eats our producers or the plants is the primary consumer, okay? So now we want you to see another example of um, a primary consumer um, in just a moment. We're gonna first make um, another strip here, but let's look at some of the primary consumers maybe you've already seen at the zoo, okay? Remember, this is a plant eater. That's how it gets energy. Another name for a plant eater, if you're a little bit older, you've probably heard this, is an herbivore, okay? Um, we got lots of herbivores at the zoo. Some of them are pictured here. We have the rhino. Um, eating lots of grass and browse. In your backyard, definitely look out for the squirrels. They're eating lots of the nuts and seed pods and things that fall into your yard. You have insects that visit your yard that are herbivores, so therefore they are primary consumers. We have gorillas at the zoo, believe it or not. Even though they're so big, they get all their energy from plants. And of course, our beavers, one of my favorite animals at the zoo. <laughs> um, and they are also eating plants. It doesn't look like always leafy green plants. They're gnawing on the trees and the trunks and they're still able to get energy. Isabel, another name for a plant eater, sometimes for humans, is a vegetarian. So I love that you made that connection. Perfect. Okay. Do you see right there at the bottom of the screen, it says primary consumer. Before Brandon switches it to me. We want that to stay on there for just a minute so that you can see the spelling of it if you're interested in spelling. And um, if you don't want to spell, you can maybe draw a squirrel, you can draw a bunny, you can draw one of the primary consumers from the screen, or you can even wait till you see the primary consumer that we are going to show you from um, our region here at the zoo. But the spelling is listed right there at the bottom. Now, Brandon, I'm going to have you go ahead and switch it to me. And how about somebody ask what color you could make this one? Love that question. Um, I would maybe make it brown, um, like a beaver, like the next animal we're going to see. Um, so if you're not interested in writing and you just want to make it brown, um, that's okay too, okay? But you're going to do just what you've done with all your other links so far. You're going to find the producer because our primary consumer is linked. I love that you drew a butterfly, Susan, perfect, is linked to our producer. So put it through that loop again. Find the two tabs there at the top, either staple, paperclip, glue, whatever you want there. But now we have three links, okay? So let me staple mine. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, when you've done that, now you have three links to our food chain, okay? So again, remind yourself it started with the sun. Maybe that's one, the one you colored yellow. Caroline, you wrote primary or just the number one consumer, or you can just color it brown. Hi, Daily. <laughs> Brooke, we're going to wait for you. I'm still just talking here, so you got plenty of time. You have the sun connected to the producer. Chloe, yes, these are primary consumers because they are actually getting um, pollen from a lot of the plants in your backyard or wherever you have your flowers planted. So they are another example of a primary consumer. A chicken, perfect, Elliot, is also a primary consumer. So if you think back to our food chain, that was the primary consumer. You guys are making lots of good connections. I love to see that. So we have the sun 
connected to the producer, connected to the first consumer. So three total. You guys finish that up. Brandon and I are gonna get situated with the next thing we wanna show you and you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. It's very cool. <laughs> Kinsey wants to know if a unicorn is a consumer. I would imagine that they are a consumer. All of the unicorns I know about eat plants. Um, elephants are also primary consumers, Hadley, very good. <laughs> All right, so let's see our primary consumers at the zoo this morning. Here's just one example. Carly, a bird is also a primary consumer. A giraffe, Landon, is a primary consumer. Let's see if you guys know what this one is. All right, so now we're back in the watering hole <laughs> and we are, um, Marla, we will see how to make the chain in just a moment here. We're gonna add one more strip to it. So, yep, you guys knew it was a warthog, fantastic. Um, and they are such a funny little animal, right? Um, you can see though, they are the first consumers here. They are consuming the grass and the watering hole and some of that clover, that's the white flower that you see down there. They spend most of their day either munching on the plants in the watering hole um, and uh, rolling in a little bit of mud or finding some shade if it's a hot day. Occasionally they venture into the actual water um, that's provided for them. Um, but if they were to open your mouth, it is like Pumbaa from the Lion King, exactly. Um, if they were to open their mouth, you would see that they have a mouthful of really flat teeth. And that's so that their teeth can grind down all of the plants that they eat. So the roots, the shoots that they're eating, um, they grind those down with their teeth by just moving them back and forth, okay? Um, they also eat probably a little bit of um, like a, a grainy material that the animal nutrition pulls um, in those bags that you saw earlier from the animal nutrition department, yep. All right, so that's our primary consumer, friends. Very good. Okay, now, so we have one more spot on our food chain this morning that we're talking about, but let's review what we have so far. This is a great time to look at your paper chain so far. We have the sun down there at the bottom. That was the first strip that you put on and you made into a circle. The sun pours its light and energy onto the grass every day and the grass grows big and tall and green, luscious. So the sun gives energy to the grass. The grass is our producer, okay? Then the warthog comes along. It's the first consumer. It's eating the grass. It's eating the plant material. The primary consumers are plant eaters. So now you the warthog was your third strip on your chain. So now we have a question mark at the top because this word here, secondary consumer, why don't you drop in the chat box if you think you know, what do secondary consumers eat? Meat, yes. Craig says meat, Peter says meat, Bronson, Mackenzie, perfect. Maya, Isabella, Claire, you guys got it. So the secondary consumers are our meat eaters, okay? So I bet you guys are probably having a good idea of what our secondary consumer is, but let's go ahead and make that last strip on our piece of paper. Brandon's going to zoom in on me one more time. Secondary consumer, you can draw a big um, number two right here. Um, you can write consumer if you want. Um, I drew a hint about what we're going to see if you have your super good looking eyes. It's not the best picture, but um, you might be able to tell what we're going to see. I'll give you a little hint there, but you're going to do the same thing. So I think it was Marla that asked, remind us again how to make that chain. So you're just making circles that um, overlap each other and are connected, okay? Some of you guys are getting it. I would say if you want to color it, um, if you're just coloring the strips, um, the color of the animal we're about to see is yellow again, but if you already use that for your son, maybe orange. And then you're gonna link that final strip through, all right? Oops, I almost put it through the sun. You wanna link it through the one that says primary consumer, because our secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. And then fasten it together. If you can't do the chain, guys, that's a-okay. Remember we said, you do what you're comfortable with during this program, okay? So now when you're finished, you have four loops all together. The sun goes to the producer, the producer goes to the primary consumer, 
and then the secondary consumer gets the last bit of energy. Okay, Brandon, I'm gonna have you move the screen back to our PowerPoint. If friends are still wanting to know how to spell secondary consumer, and you guys knew it was a meat eater, it was a carnivore, yep. Um, and here's some examples before you see the one that we're gonna see from Africa here. Here's some other ones from around the zoo. We have our wolves that are a secondary consumer. They are gonna eat meat. We have eagles. They are eating fish. So they are a secondary consumer, the eagle. They're a meat eater. Our alligators at the zoo are meat eaters, are carnivores. Cheetahs in Africa have to hunt other animals and Komodo dragons. So we have a lot of secondary consumers at the zoo. So it becomes even more important at our animal nutrition department that they um, have a good understanding of every animal's diet so that we can mimic as much as possible what they're eating in the wild. All right, so now let's go to our secondary consumer um, that might eat a warthog. Remember the warthog was our primary consumer and here they are in our heart of Africa region. Give me just a second, perfect. So many of you guys guessed it, it is our lions. We are showing um, our female lions right now because actually it's the lionesses that do the majority of the hunting um, in a pride there in Africa. So here's two lions. Uh, <clears throat> when they're eating, they're, or when they're hunting, they're crouched really low. Um, they're camouflaging a bit in some of that grass. If she opens her mouth, you'll see those super, super sharp teeth. And here's the difference. See how she's gnawing on a bone? Her very sharp triangular teeth um, are really, really good at tearing apart meat, right? Because lions are carnivores. They're eating other animals. You can see them really well right now. They do have some flat teeth, but it's those sharp pointy canines um, that help them tear apart meat and tear it off the bone. This is where you can usually see them um, in the summertime up there on that airplane. It's nice and cool on that airplane. Um, and so a lot of times two of the girls will be sitting up there and two of the girls might be off in a different area. Um, and someone asked if they were sisters before. I'm not sure because I'm not exactly sure which lions we're viewing this morning, um, our sis but we do have, um, lions that are cubs at the zoo right now. All right, so they were our secondary consumer, okay? Now, Brandon's gonna bring the screen back to me for just a moment, because we wanna talk about this chain that you guys have been, been working really hard on, right? So we can see now everything, <laughs> everything is connected here, but it's not just these um, three things that we need to think about in an ecosystem, right? There are definitely more than just lions and warthogs in Africa. And now we said everything is connected, but what I want you to think about, and this becomes really important when you think about the ecosystem as a whole, what happens, let's say, if it got to be a drought and there were, there were no grass growing, right? So I broke my chain. I broke the, the chain here because it was a drought season in Africa, and there is no longer very much grass. Drop in the chat box what happens, what do you think happens when a food source or something from a food chain is missing? Does it affect just one animal, you think? Or is it going to kind of be felt throughout the ecosystem? Some people are saying animals would die, famine, the consumer dies, exactly. Everything, many, many, many things are affected, right? That's why we need kind of everything working together in a habitat to really make it kind of a successful food chain and food web. So here's, here's some, some animals that are all affected um, in the heart of Africa region when the food chain is out of balance, right? So let's see. <clears throat> uh, we saw the warthogs. So if the grass were missing from the savanna in Africa, the warthogs would definitely feel it. They would have to either look a little bit harder or um, move to a different region um, and find a different food source. They, yes, Becca nailed it. She said it would mess up all the animals' food, exactly. <laughs> um, but other animals would feel this too. If the warthogs moved on, another animal in Africa, the cheetahs here, maybe they're gonna lose a food source, right? We know lions eat warthogs, but um, so do lots of other animals. In this next picture, you'll see the black-backed jackals there, the ones with the great big ears. Um, and then our hyenas are also pictured here. So 
everything, when it's working together in a food chain, um, all of those food sources um, are important to the animals that are part of that. If even one thing is missing, it has kind of an effect on the whole area where that animal lives. Okay, now here's, we're gonna, I don't wanna end on such a negative note, but I want to show you this next animal. You guys use the, the chat box and tell me, do you think it's a producer? Do you think it's a primary consumer, a secondary consumer? And this one um, is one of my favorites, so I hope you like it too. This is an aardvark. <laughs> um, and the aardvark has a special way of eating, right? Someone's saying it's a secondary consumer. You guys are right because um, it is, uh, sorry, it's a primary consumer. I did not mean secondary. It's going to eat um, ants and termites. Here at the zoo, it gets kind of a, a weird little diet of um, what we call instant ant. So that's like a, an ant powder mixed with water. Um, and so they are eating that. But in the wild, you'll also see them use their nose. They have an extremely long nose and a little tongue. And of course, those really sharp claws in the front there um, that you can see they can dig if they smell something, they'll dig it up real, real quick and then use their nose and their tongue um, to eat. It does look a little bit like an ant eater, right? Um, I wanted to show you this guy just because uh, we don't see him too often in the watering hole here at the zoo. All the animals kind of rotate through there. You can see they are busy. He's, he's got no time to sit and <laughs> dilly dally. <laughs> All right, so that's our aardvark. And that kind of just kind of helps us think about a bigger picture, right? So you've heard me kind of say the word food chain a, a lot this morning, but now we want to kind of think about a food web. So we put up a picture here of a spider web. When we shift our thinking to food web, um, the sun kind of is at the end, as at the beginning of all the food chains, but it's going to take its place there um, in the middle. And somebody said it's all the chains. Exactly, you guys are exactly right. It's all the chains um, that make up an ecosystem, right? Um, and so your chain, the one that we made this morning, is kind of just like one of those lines leading down to the sun, but you can see there are um, about six other lines that are other food chains that are happening in that habitat at the same time, okay? But it all starts with the sun. That's why the sun is there in the middle, okay? Let me show you what that looks like in picture format here. Okay, so if you look at the columns, there are four, right? These are four individual food chains um, that can, as you guys are noticing, um, <laughs> hi Giancarlo, <laughs> um, that are making up a great big food web. Okay, so let's go over them individually really quickly. Let's start with the one that the aardvark is part of, okay? So um, that one actually, we didn't start it with the producer, we started it with the termite mound, you can see there at the bottom. And then the aardvark is going to slurp up all those termites, right? So it is the secondary consumer in this food chain. Um, and then right above the aardvark is the hyena, okay? And actually the hyena in this case is sort of like a tertiary consumer, a third level consumer. That's not a word you need to remember. We didn't really go over that, but so this is one food chain, okay? If you shift over a little bit and go to the bottom, you'll see all that grass that we talked about growing on the savanna. The arrow moves up to the gazelle. There's a picture of a Thompson's gazelle because they're going to eat the grass. Um, and then above the Thompson's gazelle is a cheetah. And the cheetah is going to hunt the gazelle. It is the secondary consumer. It eats other animals. So this is one other food chain. This is our second food chain. Let's shift one more over, okay? There's what kind of look like weird little seed pods there at the bottom. That's the producer. That's part of an acacia tree in Africa. They produce a seed pod. Well, above the acacia seed pods, you can see there, there is um, an impala because they are able to eat those um, seed pods and they get energy. So the impala is the primary consumer. Above the impala, is a leopard, okay? If you guys have ever been in our Congo expedition um, region at the zoo, you might have seen there's like a metal leopard, um, or sorry, there's a metal impala up in a tree right by the indoor viewing yard for our leopards. That's because a lot of times leopards will drag their food up in a tree and save it for later if they can't finish everything. So the leopard is the secondary consumer. 
So that's the third food chain. And then all the way over there, our fourth and last food chain that we're gonna put in this food web. At the bottom, it starts with acacia too, but this time it's the acacia leaves. And then you can see the giraffe is the primary consumer. It eats the leaves. And then when the lioness starts to hunt, they can work together and hunt um, this giraffe. So the lion is the secondary consumer. So now we have four different food chains. So you wanna think about them being on those lines that lead down to the sun there on our food web. But let me kind of show you what I mean here. You can see now the picture got a little crazy, right? The arrows aren't just going up. And that's because on any given day, these animals can be food sources or these plants can be food sources for many animals, right? Okay, so we do want happy animals, Caroline. That is exactly right. So we have to think about everything in terms of their food, right? Even if it's a little bit uncomfortable to talk about an animal eating another animal, um, it is part of what happens out in the wild on a, on a regular basis. So let's talk about that acacia. Acacia is those very typical trees that you see in Africa. And every part of that tree is valuable to the animals that live there, right? So um, the pods can be energy for the impala, which is right above it. But the giraffes can eat the pods too. They have a really long tongue. They can strip those pods off the tree. They have those flat teeth to grind them. And so they get energy from the seed pods. Same with the, the acacia leaves. It can give energy to lots of different animals in the Africa um, ecosystem. Let's move over and shift to the gazelle. This is another great example. The gazelle is the primary consumer uh, below the cheetah there. So cheetahs hunt gazelles. That's one food chain they're part of but leopards can hunt a gazelle and lions certainly also eat gazelles. So on any given day, um, the energy can be moving all across that food web, depending on who's hungry and who's eating, um, who's eating who that day. So they are all connected. You can imagine if we removed the gazelle from this one food chain, it won't just be the cheetah that feels it, lots of other secondary consumers are gonna be um, searching for another food source. So it just goes to show you that everything is connected at the zoo, but definitely out in the wild as well. So um, someone had a question about our hyenas and I did wanna connect back to the zoo because we have two female hyenas. Um, they uh, are always out together in the watering hole they spend a lot of time um, moving in the water, but also sniffing all over <laughs> that watering hole for different food sources. I wanted to show you hyenas because certainly they are a top um, consumer in a food chain, but hyenas can also um, scavenge around for other animals' leftovers in a food chain. Very often you'll see hyenas come in after lions are done eating. Let's say a lion has eaten a gazelle and they left kind of whatever they didn't want behind, then the hyenas will come in and kind of finish it off, or even maybe a vulture will come and um, pick everything off the bone, so nothing is going to waste. Hyenas can do that because they have a super, super strong jaw, and if they open their mouth, they have a lot of really sharp teeth. Um, someone was, was wondering if the animals sometimes eat each other at the zoo. I can see that where you might be thinking that, but our animals are super duper well fed, um, so they're not very often hungry, um, but also they are going out um, only one species at a time. I know that it kind of looks like a mixed species back there in the savanna, and it is, but like there is a little bit of area between the impala, the gazelle, and the lions where they're at, so they're not all out at the same time. <laughs> Great question. <clears throat> well, what does this mean for you, right? We're a long ways from Africa. So we have, um, of course, some takeaways that you can start thinking about at your own house uh, as it relates to food chains. So we think, um, since we're all spending quite a bit of time at home, that you might be interested in planting a garden, okay? So that's one of the biggest things that you can do to actively be a part of your backyard food chain. Um, so we put up a picture here of some boxes that you can build in your backyard, but you can also plant directly in the ground. Now's a great time to start some of those vegetables, especially our lettuce, our radishes, carrots, um, peppers and tomatoes will come out very soon. And if you plant those and you take care of them, eventually you can harvest something that you can actually eat. 
And so you are um, then at the top of that food chain, but you are just the primary consumer at that point. If you're just eating um, fruits and vegetables, you are the, the primary consumer instead of maybe the secondary consumer. So you are an active part of a food chain growing right in your backyard. The other thing you can also do in your backyard is recognize that some of the things in your backyard, the trees certainly, the flowers, the grass, are part of an animal's food chain. And if your backyard gets really um, full of litter or um, something like that, then animals can't really find their food source. So take care of your backyard. You can see the little guy in this picture is recycling items from his house. You could maybe do a litter cleanup this weekend just in and around your backyard, maybe your neighborhood as well. That's a great way um, to take care of another animal's food chain. Another thing we're doing a lot more at my house is thinking about where our food comes from. Often um, I'm guilty of just making the grocery list and going to the store myself and not really thinking about my food. So you can maybe try to get your food from a farmer's market or um, a local farmer maybe. Um, but also if you are a young person, try to help mom or dad make your grocery list, okay? And think about um, where those items fall on a food chain, okay? Maybe you wanna, you wanna eat more fruits and vegetables, and that's certainly a great goal, but you're gonna have to add those to the grocery list with mom or dad, okay? Maybe make your own pretend grocery store at home and practice shopping. And then the last thing there uh, is a picture of kids in the kitchen. We would encourage you maybe also to try a new recipe uh, this week, maybe this weekend, maybe you want to try a meatless Monday coming up here. But again, that just sort of rotates your role in a food chain, kind of makes you think about what are you eating. All of these things are designed to encourage um, you to think a different way about your house, about what you're doing in your backyard, and of course, um, where the animals and plants fall on the food chain and how that relates to you. So the last thing we want to say is thank you so much for tuning in and connecting with us today from the Columbus Zoo. We hope to see you very, very soon at uh, the Heart of Africa region at the zoo. If you are interested in any social media updates regarding when the zoo will be opening or Zumbezi Bay, social media is the best place to find those answers. We are going to have a new topic next Thursday, so we hope to see you back here for that too. And I did want to mention if you had any questions that you did not get answered, Brandon and I are going to stay connected. You can drop those in the chat box and we will kind of take any other last minute questions before we sign off here today. So thanks again for tuning in. Hope you got to see some of your favorite animals at the zoo and we'll see you next week.